gonna teach us anything. What, you want me to teach you something? You wanna learn something? Alright. You got it! Hello and welcome to Atomy Brainwaves, a podcast about education for educators, where we tackle a variety of issues in the world of pedagogy. We're recording here in the studio at Atomy, an online resource for second level learning used by students and teachers alike to help make education awesome and engaging. We provide content for schools and students in Australia and the UK in the form of short, digestible, syllabus specific videos and classroom activities. I'm your host, Simon. And today I'm joined by our very special guest, Gavin McCormick, Principal of Farmhouse Montessori School here in Sydney. Welcome, Gavin. Hello. Nice to be here. Thanks yes. so much. Good to have you. Managed to beat the traffic? Only just, you know, what Sydney traffic is like. Yes. Well, it's a tough one, but we got you in here in the end. Yeah. <laughs> so, Gavin, I think it's safe to say your journey in education has been not the conventional route. You've, um, over 20 years, worked in several countries around the world. You're a published children's author. Um, you've been involved in some great school building initiatives in underprivileged areas and countries such as Nepal. Um, I guess we'll start at the beginning. What got you into teaching? Um, so thank you. Um, interesting question. I've been asked a lot of times. I always feel very flattered. Sounds like I'm really rich in your introduction, but I'm actually really poor. I have no uh, cash at all. Rich in spirit. Rich in spirit. Rich in, yep, rich in heart. Yeah. Most important. Um, Good and way. it's an interesting question, and I've thought about it a lot. And, you know, the fact is that I did my A-levels in the UK, and I had a few choices. Could have been an economist, could have been a computer scientist. Sat down with my mum one evening with the UCAS booklet open, which is a, the booklet you, you know, you choose your university your path, direction yeah. in. Yeah. And uh, said, Mum, look, what do I do? And she said, why don't you be a teacher? And I hadn't thought about it at all uh, before that point. And uh, I said, why? And she said, look, A, you're good with kids, and B, you'll never work for the man. And every day, you'll be making a difference in the world. So we thought about it, had a conversation, and then I filled it in. And I just, you, you have four or five choices of what you want to do. I just filled in one. And uh, there it was. It was sealed. I did a teaching degree at Sheffield Helm University. And uh, that's all I know now. Never look back. There you go. Sage advice. Very good advice. advice. Yeah. I was with my mum last week in the UK, and she said, remember, I put you where you are today. <laughs> Imagine if she said, be an economist. You could be sitting in a economics podcast right now uh, i could have been but actually i won't have had uh, you know being a teacher she was right uh, and it's it, you know a lot of kids at school uh, being a principal they say what am i going to be when i'm older what do you recommend and i always say be a teacher <laughs> because you know you open up the entire world to yourself and it, it's true my mom said you will never work a day in your life and you'll never work for the man because essentially you've got these 20 30 kids in front of you and your goal is to send them all out into the world to be wonderful people academics will come it's not a problem you know that's that's the easy yeah. bit the hard bit is how to get them to be good people and if you can do that then you're winning okay. and you look you know you read the news you look at the world today you see there's all you can get fed is problems and you you look at your children and think how can i send these guys out to solve those problems yeah, very fair and um you spoke there about how being a teacher opens up the world and in a very literal sense that's true for you because there's a real international element to your teaching having taught in a number of different countries i was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that what it's like being like working in different countries what you picked up along the way and how you've infused that into your teaching yeah so look um just to go back a step being a school principal you get parents saying to you oh look i really want to take my son to uh, japan for two weeks and it's in the middle of turn time can i have permission and so without hesitation, I say, yes, go, because you'll get way more there than you will sitting in our classroom. You know, our job as teachers is to try as hard as we can to bring the environment into the room. But the environment's outside, you know, it's not in your classroom. There's no substitute for experience. Exactly right. Yeah. And so uh, you're quite right, you know, your greatest education you get is travel. And teaching facilitates that. So I'm from a really small village up in Yorkshire, Horsforth. And uh, it sounds lovely, awful place. Uh, sorry if you're from Horsforth. Yeah. Um, our Horsforth fans, yeah. apologies. Okay, yeah. Uh, and I couldn't wait to get out of there as quick as I could. You know, from a school, 1,000 kids uh, just lost in the crowd, uh, had one friend, and uh, thought, just get me out, get me through this and get me out of here. And uh, went to university and then finished university and thought, right, let's, 
let's go now. You know, like this, I, I, it was a time when the internet had kind of just started. I remember having a laptop at, at uni in my in my room in my house and opening it and typing in countries like, oh, look at Japan, like look at Indonesia, look at and I'm kind of so far away. I only ever go to Europe. It's just, you know, Europe when you live in the UK just seems like that's the only place you go. You go to Spain or you go to Greece. It just seems so distant. And looking at pictures, thinking, God, I want to see that with my eyes. And then off you go. You just start on this crazy journey. So I, I was working in the UK, and I started working for a primary school in Sheffield. It was a school dominated by Pakistani children, all from India. So I got this rich history, you know, of India. And parents would bring me food and say, here's a pakora, here's a lambuna. And I'd be like, wow, what is this? This tastes amazing. I really want to go to where this is, you know, from. Um, and then I'm, I used to play football, so I moved to I moved to France and played football there, but did some teaching along the way. Then I moved to Spain, lived in Gibraltar for a while, and then uh, off I went, just traveling around the world. Uh, was in China for a long time, was in Seoul and Korea for a long time. Ended up in Australia. And when I got to Australia, I thought, what can I do, you know? I want to be a teacher. Where do I go? Where do I start? And I picked up loads of Arabic along my journey. So I worked in this Muslim school for quite a long time. So I just opened a newspaper. There's a school uh, that was uh, looking for a teacher over in Lakemba, Western Sydney. So I went along to the interview. And uh, there were all Muslim ladies, Muslim staff, Muslim children. I said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And the lady said, you speak Arabic. And I said, Masha'Allah, I speak a little bit. And she said, you've got the job. <laughs> so without even interviewing me, she said, you've got the job. You're a year th three teacher. And, I wired uh, straight in the door. Yeah. yeah, it was amazing, really. And uh, I worked there for 10 years in that Islamic school, and uh, it was absolutely life-changing. It was amazing. Uh, parents were unbelievable. Students were fantastic. But they were bottom of the barrel. They were refugees coming off of boats with these horrifying stories. Mm -hmm. And that was when it really hit home. What my mum had said can make a difference. And really, there, you were making the biggest difference you could ever make. And... Um, you know, I'd send those children home at the end of the day feeling extremely proud. I'd drive home with a big smile on my face. Um, and the stories that they came in to tell me about what happened and their journey and how they got here. They were on a boat from Indonesia on the way to Australia with mom and dad and their two brothers and the boat went down. And they watched their brother go under and they didn't ever see him again on that day. And they were rescued right. and taken back to Indonesia. And dad put them back on a boat because to go home was going to be absolutely horrifying. They'd do anything to get away from it. And then they are in your class telling you this story and you think, I've got to help you. I've got to do something to empower you to make sure that you succeed. So anyway, 10 years went down the track and I became a Montessori teacher and now I'm a Montessori principal. But about three months ago, it was Eid, Eid al-Fitr, which is the big Eid festival. And I went out to, um, to Bankstown with my wife and we went for a little walk around. And uh, this girl came over to me wearing a hijab, about 25 years old. She said, Mr. McCormack. And I said, yeah, that's me. Uh, who are you? She said, you don't remember me, but I used to be in your class. And I said, wow, uh, what's your name? She said, my name is Fatima. And I said, uh, wow, you know, great. What are you doing? And she said, before I tell you what I'm doing, I was the worst kid in school. And I was in your class in year six and I've been expelled. I've been suspended twice. And when I came into your class, you knew my reputation and you made me school captain. And I said, I remember you now. I made you school captain because I thought, you know, if I gave you responsibility, you'd step up. She goes, I'm a lawyer now. And I always hold it thanks to you making me school captain. And it felt That's like crying. Incredible. I was crazy. And uh, I put it on my Facebook page. I took a photo. I stuck it on my Facebook page and it went crazy, like 100,000 shares, thousands of people sharing it because... That is the true essence of why you become a teacher. If you find that child, you give them the chance, you make the difference, you send them off, you never see them again. It's really sad because you say, off you go, go and swim. They never swim back to you. They go, but you hope that they're out there. There's a big fish, you know, making a difference. And then when you get that feedback that it actually worked, then you realize it's actually worthwhile. And that's the, I guess that's the crux of it. And any teachers listening, I mean, that's the, that's the, that's the ultimate. In fact, the ultimate goal, you know, you look at your, you're doing your lesson plan. You go, oh, here's my objective. My teaching, my learning objective, I'm going to teach these kids how to learn fractions. Great. And then you assess them. Did they learn how to, you know, add two fractions together? Yes, that's great. But take it big, 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 big. Go big. What's your ultimate goal? The ultimate goal is world peace. Sounds crazy. But if you educate enough kids to be good people, and we all do it as teachers, and everyone's sending those kids out that are humble and have empathy and compassion, yeah. and, you know, all those wonderful things you want that aren't facts, they're skills, we'll get it. We'll get there. But 
it'll take time. Yeah. And it takes enough. You need enough teachers singing the same tune as you to make that happen. And, and it is something that we can lose perspective on in the kind of humdrum of everyday life. Of and for, for a lot of teachers, it, it can be very easy and understandable to lose sight of that. You know, you give the example of teaching fractions or whatever it is that you're teaching. But I suppose having gone through those experiences, having kind of such like a, a broad worldview, it kind of, do, do you feel like that helps you maintain that perspective within your classroom? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's no question about that. And you and you look, you see, you know what you're doing. You know that every, you know, what's the analogy? Throw enough pebbles into enough ponds and you'll make a wave. And then you can ride that wave wherever you like. Um, and that's the case. You've got 30 kids in front of you. You've got 30 kids who will go out there. And if they're change makers and leaders, they change the world themselves. All you've got to do is make sure that you allow them to have the skills to do that. So I think that, you know, school leaders and school teachers um, alike, they need to have, uh, you know, a time to reflect it's not having staff meetings where you talk about here's the timetable, here's what we're going to teach, and here's what the government said, and here's yeah. what I need you to do. It's why are you actually here? Why are you coming to school every day teaching? Like, what's the what's your aim? And if they lose perspective, your job is to say, hey, guys, this is why you're here. And you find that your teachers suddenly go, you know what? I'm actually making a difference here. This is my job. And everything else follows from everything that. Follows. I mean, it, it, it's not that putting a focus on that, the human element, I suppose, for want of a better word. It's not that putting the focus on that means you you lose everything else in terms of syllabus and content. That that follows on. And I, and I suppose you could even say is heightened and improved yep. by making having that human compassion at the core of what your yep. classroom is about. So there's, and this is part of my, you know, I, I have this following online and, you know, this year I've been named on LinkedIn as like the 2019 top voice of education in the world and the, anyway, whatever. Not that I care about that, but the reason probably that it's being named on there is because these are the kind of things I write about. And teachers, they don't want to teach the facts. They don't want to follow that script anymore. What they want to do is they want to teach what makes their heart sing. And it's very easy to entwine those syllabus outcomes. You know, yes, you're teaching fractions. Great. What are you going to teach fractions about? Well, find something that's actually appropriate that will, your children will feel empowered about learning and then teach that. And But then just incorporate fractions into that. Or if yeah. you're teaching history, you're teaching Romans, you're teaching, you know, writing. For example, at school, we had this, um, you know, it says in the in syllabus, write a persuasive text right so you know in schools i've worked in before the principal said yeah we're writing persuasive text so what i want you to do everyone we're all going to write a letter to the principal about changing the uh, school uniform and you probably did that when you were at school as well i knew you were going to say that try as as you know absolute garbage yeah. every kid knows you know what the principal's not going to read them a and b we're not going to be able to not wear a uniform so what's the point so i mean it's very simple all you have to do is say to children you know what we're going to write a letter and we did this so at school, I had my stage two class, six to nine years old. And I said, you know, we're going to write to the local member, James Griffin of Manly, and we're going to we're going to ask him to come to school. I've got his address here. Here's a picture of him. And you tell them why. Because actually, we need him to come and see what Montessori schools are like. So that then when we want to go out there and tell everyone about it, he can be an, an advocate. So I said, we're going to write to him and you're going to tell him about what Montessori is like. I'm not going to tell you what to write. You're here, you're students. You try and persuade him to come. Now, I'm not going to mark these letters. In fact, I'm not going to read them at all. The assessment is if James Griffin is sitting in your classroom. If he's sitting in this chair, then you've succeeded. And if he doesn't come, well, we failed, and we're going to have to think about why. So all the children write their letters. I don't know what's in them. Some of them, you know, there could be anything in there. We seal them, we go to the post office, we post them, and then we sit and wait. Then the phone rings, and who is it? It's James Griffin. And he's like, I'd like to come to school. I've got your letters. So sitting in front of the children, all the children are there in a group, and he doesn't know uh, our objective. He doesn't know that. When I explained to him, I explained to the children, look, you know, our, your assessment was that if he's here, um, you know, that you've achieved your goal. And here he is. And he's like, did, is that true? Did you really do that? I said, of course, you've got to make it real. And the assessment in real life is that, you know, that if you steal something, you're going to be in trouble. You know, if you don't work hard enough, you're not going to achieve your goals. It doesn't mean you get an E or an A or a B. Regardless, it doesn't really matter. You know, every action has a consequence. And the consequence of you writing to him is that he is here. And the fact is that after that, the children said, 
can we write to Tony Abbott? Can we write to the Prime Minister? Can we write to the Queen? And you say, why? Hungry for more. Yeah, and you say, why? And they say, because I want to do X or because I don't agree with that or because I don't like this. And you say, they're the kids who go out and change the world because they know that their voice means something. It's real, it's tangible, and it's, you know, it's real life. It's not writing to the principal to change yeah, your that uniform. that real world it's experience. Real world. And when you do that every single day and every single lesson... And you love your job, you know you're making a difference, and the children love coming to school. Yeah, that's awesome. God, I, I, I really want to read those letters now. I'm really keen I'm to... I'm afraid you can't because they're, they've gone. They've gone. Yeah. Well... But, I mean, you don't need to because you know they were good. They did yes. the job. Yeah, that's the important thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, you know, and in the syllabus it says you must use persuasive devices and emo you know, emotive language. So you teach their skills... And then you hand them over to the children. It's like saying, here's loads of tools, fix this engine. Or here's an engine with no tools, fix it. That, that's impossible. You know, you may as well give them the tools, give them the, the objective, and then they'll go away and succeed. Awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. So just bringing it back for a second, you were talking a little bit about you know, how you do quite a bit of writing, workshops, lectures, that kind of thing. Yeah. I was hoping we could maybe dive a little bit into the kind of the philosophy behind that. And first place to start, I suppose, is to unpack... Um, what you might call the planes of development yep. in a child's maturity. So I was hoping if you could talk those through us, talk yep. us through those rather a little bit and explain what they mean. Yeah. So look, uh, Montessori, uh, when I was first introduced to it, uh, Bill McKeith, who's a, a world-renowned principal, especially in Australia, he used to run uh, Presbyterian Ladies College for 25 years, good friend of mine, uh, my mentor for quite a long time. Um, he introduced me to Montessori. He said, I think you might be a Montessori teacher without knowing, and I hadn't done the training. And I thought it was a religion. Actually, I thought it was a cult. And I well, said, is it a cult? He said, certainly not. You know, you should come and see one. So I went which along. That's exactly what someone would say if it was a cult, but exactly nevertheless. Right. Yeah, come along, wear this gown. Yes. And I wore the gown. No, I didn't. There's no gown. Um, and I went along and had a look, and I was like, you know, this is unbelievable. This is actually right up my street. And um, then I got into what it's all about and I started reading about it. Then I did a degree in Montessori and then I really understood it. And, you know, she was um, the first lady, Maria Montessori was the first lady to graduate from Italian university ever. And she was a child psychologist. And what she did was she observed children for a very long period of time. Part of being a Montessori teacher is observation. You do a lot of your assessment by just watching. Yeah. And you can take a lot away from just watching. And I think teachers lose perspective of that. They're just teaching the whole time and they don't get a chance to sit back and just watch what's happening, who's talking to who's playing with who, who's, you know, bullying who, who's being mean, who's having trouble, who's looking out the window, who's asleep, you know, who's struggling. And when you sit back and watch, you have a really good perspective. And what she did when she did her observations was she she segregated or separated the children into these kind of age brackets. So she put them into zero to three and then three to six, six to nine and nine to 12. And she put them into those age groups for specific reasons. Um, she had something called the absorbent mind. And I don't know if you know this, but 90% or 80, between 80 and 90% of everything you'll ever learn is in by eight, by the time you're eight years old. Fact. You can look up and learn if you want. 80%. No, I, I trust you. 80% of everything you're ever going to get into your brain is there before you're eight. So that's a crucial time. So in that time, she made sure that between the zero to three and the three to six in the classroom, that everything was hands-on. Everything was tactile. It was sensorial. You could touch it, feel it, smell it, do it, pick it up. Um, and that sets the children up for huge amounts of success later. Because, you know, when I was a child at primary school, I and, and, and even through high school, I never knew what a million looked like. You know, I, I knew it was a big number. And you ask a kindergarten child, you know, what's the biggest number? And they go, 100. It's the biggest thing in the world. It's 100. Yeah. Um, but in the Montessori, you can, you can not only touch a unit, so you can pick up a unit cube. And, you, you know, you had these at school. Then there's a 10 cube. There's a 100 cube. Then there might be a 1,000 and it stops. Well, Montessori goes up to a million cube. So you go to the child, go and get me a unit. And they go, there's a unit. You go, go and get me the million cube. And they go and pick up this million cube, which is exactly one million times heavier and bigger than the unit cube. And there you have this amazing perspective. So I was in, in India recently doing this talk and I asked these teachers, I, I wanted to get some perspective on what they knew, some you know, global knowledge. And I said, what's bigger, moon 
or the sun? You've got three choices. The sun's bigger, the moon's bigger, or they're the same size. A large majority of these teachers said same size. Wow. Right. Now, if you're four, and that's a misconception through lack of education and lack of exposure to it. Yeah. If you're four and you already know that the earth is a unit cube and the sun is the million cube and I can hold those up to you and you say, there's some perspective. It's maths, you know, but it's tangible. You can touch it. You can feel it. You can see it. A visual representation. That ratio the is concept, there. You yeah. can just see it and touch it. And children, you're never going to forget that even though they look exactly the same size in the sky, you know what? That's a million times bigger than Earth. That's absolutely gigantic. So she set it up in a way from the three to six that everything is, you can touch it and feel it. But she also made sure that you had this real level of independence within that plane, that first plane, that you learn how to self-regulate and you learn how to be yourself. Because then you go into the six to nine, which is the second plane, and you get to find your way. That's when the classroom is really busy and there might be two kids having a debate over there and there might be some kids working on their own. It could be a group of five children and one child saying, you're not, you're not the boss of me and all this kind of stuff's happening. And they're, they're finding their way. They're finding their place. They're finding who's the leader, who's the top, who's a follower. And because you've got these wonderful groupings of, when I say three to six, I mean three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, and six-year-olds all in the same room. So that your hierarchy is already set by age. You have your leaders. You have your next group who learn from your leaders. And your next group will learn from the learners from the leaders. And therefore, it just flows down. So as a teacher, yes, you need to teach the curriculum. But your kids will teach each other how to be how to be yeah. good people, how to be responsible. They call stuff out. So if someone leaves something on the floor, they say, hey, by the way, that's not how we do it in here. You need to pick that up. You need to do that yourself. Mm. And it's not because of the rules. It's because of the group. It's because that's the ethos of your school. That's the yeah. pedagogy. That's what you teach. You know, the old rule is, you know, model the behavior you wish to view in your children. Yeah. So the teacher says, guys, you know, I'm going to care for you. I'm going to be really loving. I'm here when you need me, okay? But I will call things out if they're wrong. The children just go, well, that's what we're going to do also. So they do the same thing. Anyway, so you get into the six to nine, and they find their way. And, uh, you know, they get they, they build that resilience. I think a really important point to make is that as Montessori teachers, we don't step in. So if two children are having a – the old conventional method, and you probably had the same, is two children are sitting at their table and they're talking and you say, guys, separate. You guys are talking. I want you over there. Tommy over there. Johnny sitting over there. You're sitting together anymore. A very familiar of course. refrain. Yes. We all went through that, and I'm sure you know many people out there have been through that too. And look at us sticking to them now. Two exactly of us sitting right. side by side. Chat there you go. Yeah, six foot five and just <laughs> living it large. But what I will say is that as a Montessori teacher, we don't step in. Unless it gets too hairy, we let that work itself out. Because as I said before, the consequence of you two not getting on with it, one of them will recognize, you know what, if we don't do this, we're not actually going to get very far. We're not going to be able to finish our project and then it's not going to be able to, you know. And then they work it out. Or one child says, I don't want to sit next to you anymore because you're slowing me down with my work and we'll leave. The other child says, God, you know, I better stop talking so much because nobody wants to sit with me. And so the environment teaches them the rules as it does with us. You know, if I'm awful to my friends, no one's going to call me and invite me to go for a beer or go out, you know, do anything. If I'm nice to them, well, maybe they will. And that's a life rule, a life lesson that you, you can instill in your room. So they learn that in, in stage two, the six to nine, and then you get to nine to 12, and everyone just knows who they are, they're confident, they're resilient, empathetic, compassionate, and they just they just nail it. They're just doing things that you could never imagine. You've got children who attend, they're writing books and selling 500 copies and raising money and sponsoring other kids to go to school in Wagga. They're, you know, they're doing, they're, they're, they're changing the world and they're 9, 10, 11 years old. And then they leave and you feel so proud that you're sending out into the world. I mean, we went swimming today as a school. And one child was struggling to put his socks on. So without even stepping, another child goes, hey, can I help you put your socks on? And you look at those tiny little wins and you realize you're doing a good job. Yeah. Because later on, that's someone has fallen down in the road or someone needs help or someone needs a helping hand. And they'll be the ones who will yeah. do that. And what's really speaking to me as sort of a core premise of that is that idea of initiative and independence, which, I mean, if you could point out a flaw in, I guess, more traditional styles of teaching is if it's so prescriptive, you sort of reach 
the end of schooling and then at that point it's almost initiative is assumed yeah. and it's it, it's probably the most valuable skill in adulthood being totally. able to be end, independent make your own decisions be proactive but if it's not cultivated if it's not given room to breathe yeah. in schooling how can you really expect it on the other end and it sounds like that's really at the heart yeah of well the philosophy. linchpin is is the independence that's top of the game you know, you look at your, I think there's 66 essential skills that a Forbes released in 2018, and they were the 66 top skills that you will need to get the best jobs in the best companies in the world. And top of the pile was independence, number one. That's they want nice someone reason. who can be independent. And you look, you just, I guess the situation is that you have to be creative with your curriculum. But when you are creative and you say, I mean, the rule of thumb is you say yes. You shouldn't say, can I? And before they finish talking, you say yes. Yes, of course you can. You know, within limitations, obviously. Can I blow up the school? No. Okay, can I burn down a school? No. Can I write, you know, uh, with so many stories uh, that I can tell you where a child has come forward with an innovative um, idea and just by saying yes, amazing things have happened and you've ticked off nearly the entire curriculum without even doing, you know, thinking about one day, doing one day's planning or writing one learning objective down. Which sounds almost quite simple. And yes, it definitely is the case where there are a lot of teachers who, and this is not meant as a criticism, but their default setting might be no, because we need to get through this. We need to get through that. I've got X other students in the classroom. So yeah. before even hearing what follows, can I, yeah. it's unfortunately not. Yeah. We have other things to do. Or unfortunately not, because I lose control of my 30 kids. I need them all looking at me, eyes on me, eyes on me. Yeah. And I need you all listening and looking at me because I'm the Oracle and I know everything and you can only be as smart as me, not smarter, because I'm going to tell you everything that I know. That's The fact is, some children are way smarter than me in my school. You know, they know every dinosaur. I've got one child at school who knows every single type of dinosaur. He knows a full history, the weight, how many hearts they had, the lot, all their bones. I don't know any of those things. So if I want to teach him dinosaurs, I can't. I just simply can't do that. I can teach him the Brachiosaurus. That's the only one I know. And if I do that, then I, I fail. But if he says, Gavin... Can I write a book on dinosaurs with all of my knowledge? Is that okay? Of course you can. No problem. Uh, because, you know, he'll inspire so many more of the children to do exactly the same thing. And you'll gain so much from that confidence, self-esteem, respect. He will inspire so many others to do that. He'll have to deal with money. He'll have to make negotiations. And look, if you've, if you've got time, I've got this story about this girl that wanted to write a newspaper. Fire away. Okay, so I was working at a school over in Balmain, and a girl said, uh, you know, I'd like to write a school newspaper. So obviously the answer is yes, of course you can. But before I say yes, tell me why. Because uh, it's all about intention. And she, so she, if she said, Gavin, I want to sell it for $5 a copy and buy myself a Ferrari, it would be, no, thank you. You can't do that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Your intention is all wrong. Um, but her intention was, I want to sell copies of it and then give the money to the homeless in Newtown. Because wow. I saw a homeless truck there and I think I can help them. So, of course, the answer is yes. So she's 10. And uh, so I said, well, you'll need a plan. You, you know, you can't. You can't pull this off without a plan. J.K. Rowling didn't write a book without planning it first. You know, she had to plan it out. So she said, okay, no problem. And uh, I said, what do you think you're going to need first? And she said, I'm going to need some journalists because I can't write it all on my own. So I said, okay, well, how are you going to get them? And she said, I'm going to put some posters up around school tomorrow. I said, okay, that's great. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. So at the end of the day, I went home, came in the morning, and she'd made all these posters, journalists required. And um, on there, there was sports, history, travel, fun, games, quizzes. And she stuck them all up around school and she said, apply within. And she put a red post box that she'd made out of a cardboard box in the foyer and said, uh, apply within, write your letters of persuasion and stick them in the box and I will uh, get back to you. So 500 kids at the school, about 300 kids applied from kindergarten wow. to year six. Kindergarten letters were, I want to be a writer in there. Anyway, so she got them all. I said, Gavin, what do I do? I've got 300 letters. So, well, you're going to have to read them. And she said, what do I do then? I said, well, I don't know. What do you think you need to do? And she goes, I've got an idea. Maybe I can select the top 20 and then interview them all and choose the best 10. I said, that's great. Great idea. So she read them all. She came to me. I've got the top 20. They're here. I think that these are going to suit me. She said, I want to interview them tomorrow at playtime. I'll put a table in the playground and I'll give them a time schedule and they can come to an interview and I'll ask them some questions. I said, great. So off she went and just sat back and watched it. There we go. Playtime comes around. She's interviewing these children one at a time. She's timetabled them in and given them a timetable each. They know they've got to come. They have this interview and she chooses her top 10. She then tells them, 
I need you to write me an article. It's got to be 300 words. It needs a picture. I need you to give it to me on a USB stick because I'm going to do a newspaper. All the kids go away and start to write their articles. Now, I did help her at this point because she needed a um, she needed a template for a newspaper, which is very tricky. So I made one for her. The fact that she'd gotten to this point without needing any help is incredible. It gets crazier. So then um, at that point, um, she um, collects all the articles in and she, she copied and pastes them into this newspaper, designs a logo and says, Gavin, I'm, I'm ready. I think I've got the newspaper. I said, look, I said, wow, she's unbelievable. And re- literally it was unbelievable. Two sides of A3 paper folded over, you know, good as you can like, called the, the Evergreen Editorial, right? Pretty good name. Yeah, snappy name. And alliteration, beautiful. She's I'd a, buy it. Yeah, exactly right. So anyway, um, Gavin, I want to I want to print two thousand copies of it. And I said, "Whoa, look, this is starting to get a bit strange because I can't go and print two thousand copies. It's not going to be worth you selling the newspaper because of the printing." I said, "It's over. This newspaper is finished. You need another solution." And she said, "Okay." She looked a bit devastated. She went home. Next morning, she comes in. Gavin, can I use the telephone? And when I tell teachers that I let her use the telephone, they say, "What? You let a kid use a telephone?" It's a telephone. You know, of course they can. Mm-hmm. And uh, so she, I said, yeah, of course you can. You know, why do you want it? She said, there's a printer on Darling Street, and I want to call them and tell them that if they print my newspaper for free and on recycled paper, I will put their logo and their advertisement on the back page, and 2,000 people will read it. Business savvy. Oh, wow. mm, I yeah. said, that is gold. So I rung the printers and just preempted the call, put the phone down, didn't tell her. I said, the phone's there. Go ahead. She called. He accepted the offer, and then we he shot over the logo and the ad. We put it on the back. 2,000 copies arrived at the post. She sold them at the front gate, made $4,000. Hey, presto, over to Newtown and gave it to the homeless society where she was holding a big check in the newspaper of, you know, in the, in the Western suburbs newspaper of her donating. And the newspaper went from strength to strength. In the next term, the next term it was 3,000 copies, and she was 10. So you can imagine Incredible. when she's 15, 16, she's taking on the world. There's no question about that. And if you go back in the curriculum and start ticking off outcomes, well, I could be here all day. Speaking and listening, nearly every kid in the school wrote a letter for a purpose. It was persuasive. No teacher said a word. Spe- they were interviewed. There were timetables. There was scheduling. There was, it was out of control. And there was no teacher involved. All I did was say yes. That and, is incredible. You know, a bit of scaffolding along the way, but... You can do that. You know, you can do that. You can do it in so many ways. And I think teachers, they feel trapped by the syllabus, but the outcomes actually are quite broad. you just got to look between the lines and think, okay, what can I do with that? And the government, you know, they want that. They want innovative practice. They come in and they say, show me how you met the outcomes. You say, well, we did this. Look, they, they want that change. So people are a bit too scared to make that leap. Yeah, that's incredible. Wow. Evergreen editorial. The, uh, the only one criticism I can make is that had there been a dinosaur section, I'm sure there would have been one student who would have yep. done a wonderful weekly column on dinosaurs. But Look, aside from that, they may have it may have emerged. Later. Have, well, yep. you know, food for thought for future issues. Go. Yeah. So look, going back to your initial question, sorry we got off topic, but the, yeah, the planes of development are very specific. You know, at the beginning it's all about tactile. Seconds about finding a way. As you get old, it's about becoming independent and exploring things that are more real life, like microeconomics and whatnot, Perfect, um, yeah. and setting them up for success later. Yeah. And. Let's dive a little into how that enacts itself in real time. There's one element in your writing which I really spoke to me is this idea of essential skills yep. in the classroom. And I wanted to kind of see if we could talk a little bit about that, what they are, yep. and how they, I mean, we've touched on a little bit so far, but what they are and how they get brought to life yep. in so, the school context. Well, you know, traditional standard classroom, and we went to these classrooms as teacher at the front, 30 kids looking at the teacher, eyes on me. And, you know, you're not going to be hitting all the children there with that teaching. Some children, auditory learners, kinesthetic, you know, auditory, you know, literal. And you'll lose some of them along the way. So Montessori does it slightly differently. And I call it the 20% rule. And the 20% rule works a little bit like this. Rather than standing at the front for an hour, which is actually very tiring, you know, spinning the plates at the front of being the entertainer and the showman, the idea is that you step back a bit and go, okay, what am I actually teaching here? I'm teaching dinosaurs. So... Instead of standing at the front and saying, guys, I'm going to teach you about dinosaurs, 
Let's look at this picture on the board, which I produced earlier on by going on Google, and I've just put it on the smart board. And then we're going to talk a bit. You're going to read this paragraph that's in your textbook, highlight the keywords, answer these questions, remember everything I said on Friday, and you get a grade A. <laughs> right. Yay. Well done. Yeah, that's like 1920s Victorian England, whatever. Those days are done. Um, and a big shift in the world, Sweden, Denmark, Switzerland, you know, in Australia, lots of innovative schools. They, they're taking a different a slant on these things. And I call it 20% rule. And what it is, is you just teach them the 20% of the inspirational stuff, and then you stop. So if you were my students now, and I was teaching you about dinosaurs, I'd teach you about the Brachiosaurus, because it was the same size as two double-decker buses. It had two brains, one in its head and one in the end of its tail, which it evolved to have because its tail was so far away from its head that when it was attacked, it didn't feel pain, got an infection, and died. So in order to combat that, and I can see your eyebrows are raised because you're already impressed. I, I certainly am. It, it, it then evolved to survive because of that. And at this point, children are like, are you serious? And you say, of course I'm serious. And you say, its heart was the size of a mini metro. And it would lay an egg every hour the size of a Range Rover for 200 years. And by that time, you've got the, everyone's grip. And you, I say, you stop talking. And then you say this key question. Now, what would you like to know about dinosaurs? And the children say, you know, I want to know what wiped them out. Great. I could tell you, but I'm going to write that question down. And then the other hands go up. You know, how big was the Tyrannosaurus Rex's arms? Great question. So you write these questions down. They come up with them themselves. And then you say to the children, now, you've got a week. In a week's time, we're going to meet back here. You've only got four kids in your group. The rest of the kids are independently working. And you'll see how this works in a second. But you've got your four kids and you're doing a little lesson with them. In a week's time, I would like you to go away, so in the next week, research one of these questions or all of them. You can use the library, you can talk to a friend, ask your grandfather, ask your dad, jump on Google, use the iPad, however you want to do this. But in a week's time, we're going to meet here, and you're going to answer one of them or all of them. You can work with whoever you want, on your own, in pairs, in a group, and you can represent your research in however you want. It can be a report, it can be a picture, it can be a dance, a rap, a painting, a model, you name it. But in a week's time, I'll see you here. And immediately, they're all fired. Oh my God, I'm working with you. Oh, let's go. Let's go to the library quickly. And off they go. They're all inspired because they feel like they wrote their own curriculum, number one, which they did. You're the puppeteer in the background playing the game. You know, you've got to teach dinosaurs. Well, you are. You just inspired them. Yeah. Um, and off they go. Now, when they go and work in their groups, you're working on your own, but actually it doesn't work for you. You feel lonely, actually. You don't. So you might want to go and team up with somebody else working on your own. So you go over and say, hey, Tommy, do you mind if I work with you? Well, there's communication, an essential skill straight away. And now Tommy doesn't want to work with you because he wants to work on his own, but he sees you're struggling. So he says, okay. You can work with me. Well, there's empathy straight away. And you've got a group of five kids over there who've decided they're going to build a model of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. And off they go. But one kid is dominating the group. He's being really bossy. Another kid says, you know what? I don't like you being the boss of me. I'm leaving this group. So there's voice, someone speaking up on determination and perseverance. Yeah. Another guy, the kid who loses his group because he's being too bossy and has not working on his own, then has to reflect. There's self-reflection and evaluation. Yeah. And then, anyway, a week's time, they all come back. And you say, guys, what happened? And you're, you're sitting back and you observe. So you know what happened in actual fact. But all those skills that you want to teach, you don't need to teach just need to prepare an environment where they will teach themselves their skills because actions have consequences. And then you come back a week later and you reflect upon it. And that child will say, you know what? I wanted to work in a group, but nobody wanted to work with me. And you say, well, what happened? And they say, well, he was being really bossy. What will you do then? He'll say, well, next week I won't be so bossy. Okay. And you point out those wonderful aspects. He says, I saw that you reached out and asked Tommy to work with you. He didn't want to work. What happened? They said, well, I could see he was sad, so I really wanted to help him out, so he worked with me. Okay, wonderful. And, you, you know, you can see that. But a week later, they come back and they present their research to you. And what's really special about that is your architect in the room, who's only seven, he'll always come back with a model every time. Yeah. And later, he will be an architect. And the dancer in the room, He'll come back with a dance every week, and he will be a dancer when he's older. But if I say to all my children, okay, everybody, you're all going to write a report because it says report in my program, then the kids are all uninspired. You're not inspired because what you had to deliver was 
garbage and was preconceived by somebody else, wrote it, you didn't write it yourself. You're not inspired, they're not inspired, you lost them straight away. And that taking that angle on teaching opens up a world of wonder. And you can see, I'm just pointing out a few, those essential skills, they just teach themselves. Yeah. All you've got to do is prepare the environment ready for them to be able to do that and say yes and be able to step back. When that child is lonely, don't say, you better work together because he's lonely. Let him go and find the answer himself. And what's, what's incredible about that in one sense is I'm just thinking back to my own experience in university. And a lot of what you're saying here is the sort of things, this idea of setting your own questions, working in groups, determining how your report or presentation is going to look. It's the kind of thing that you'll see in university, but you won't see it before. Yeah. You know, and it's 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 funny because some of the problems you're talking about, somebody being bossy, somebody not working well in groups or working better alone or not working better alone. It's something they're only finding out at that stage. Exactly right. And it 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 makes so much sense that it should be something they should find out far before because then by the time comes when they're at that stage, they'll be like, Okay, I know what yep. works for me. I know whether you know what type of presentation I'm gonna do best how many people I work well with, yep. what my role in the group is. So it makes absolute sense Look to let those skills breathe. Do you remember Very going to the principal's office when you were seven, knocking on his door and saying, I didn't like it when you said this? I... Do not, actually, but so uh, I have. I that. feel like there's a very real possibility. A few weeks that ago, a kid knock on the door and say, Gavin, I, w- I would like to talk to you. No problem. Come in, sit down. Last week, you came in the library and you said something about being embarrassed. I didn't like it because uh, I felt embarrassed. And, I, and we had a conversation about how it was a miscommunication and a misunderstanding, which it was. Um, but just having the knock on the door from yeah. a seven-year-old, having a voice to the principal, I mean, you don't get that. Yeah. They're never going to get bullied in the office when they're older. They're never going to get pushed around by anyone because they'll say, hey, I don't like it when you do that. Can you stop doing it? Yeah. Which I think I didn't have at school. You know, I had some people pushing me around. I just didn't have a, didn't have a voice to do anything about it. And I, if I could go back in time, you know, I'd go to a Montessori school or yeah. I'd go to a school that scaffolded my education where I can have the skills in place. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's when, when parents come on school tours I do the talk. I, it's not a it's not a sell. It's hey, this is what you get. Let's go look at it in action. And then you walk in the door, and parents go, "I can see that right there. That's amazing." And they run to the, where do I sign? Where, what can I get on the wait list? <laughs> yeah, best way, I suppose, show them as opposed yeah. to tell. Yeah. Well, look, I always you know, there's some very very important and key people in the world who went to Montessori schools. You know, you've got the guys who invented Google, Montessori kids. Guys who invented Wikipedia, Montessori kids. Um, Amazon. Montessori. But my best one is Taylor Swift. Not that I'm a big fan of her music. I'm more of a death metal guy, but, <laughs> uh, you know, not usually in primary schools, that's not what you get, but. So you can't really blare that out. With yeah, the kids you can't around. blare it out, yeah, in your office. Yes. You know, you need N you're on when they come in. Yeah. But, you know, she writes her own music. She writes her own words. She speaks out against inequality. And that, that resonates. You know, that's what you want. She probably learned that when she was four. She's also a terrific businesswoman. On top of that. Yeah, she probably had a school newspaper called the Evergreen Editorial. Oh, without a doubt. <laughs> and hey, I'm a Montessori kid myself, so this is music to my ears. That's right. Well, I noticed you're a good communicator. So. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I'm the next Taylor Swift. You heard it here first. That's right, yep. <laughs> well, I, I, I almost feel like we could keep talking about your teaching philosophy for hours, but we'll, we'll unfortunately have to move on. But what I wanted to ask was to bring it back to yourself for a moment and sort of talk about what's what's next on your journey because there's been, you know, so many wonderful experiences and stories that we've heard about so far. So what's coming up next? What's in the pipe? Um, so, look, I'm, I'm principal over at Farmhouse Montessori at Manly. Got a couple of campuses there. School is great. You know, I'm just so proud of it. You know, I uh, walk around and think, wow, this is just amazing. And my old mentor, Bill McKeith, said, look, the best thing about being a principal is you have a whole community at your disposal to change the world. And I've got this group of parents who are, you know, they're on board, they're change makers, they want to shake it up. We just had an open day and it was plastic free, no waste open day, you know. Uh, you know, we had a coffee van that turned up and people brought their own mugs from their house and, and the children are on board with that. So we are, um, as a school, we're growing. Uh, people are coming to have a look. They want to um, see what it's like and what does Montessori really need. And because I'm such a, you know, an advocate and a big voice for it, um, they go away with really positive messages. So the school is obviously my main priority, nine to five, 40 weeks a year. But I utilize my holidays in a different way than most. Um, So 
Every holiday when the bell rings, I fly off to the Himalayas and uh, I built four or five schools in the Himalayas over the last five years, Montessori schools, um, some on the south of Nepal over in near the Indian border on the Ganges, some up in Carvere, up near Everest and in Kathmandu, a couple of teacher training centers, one in Kathmandu and one in Buttle in the south and uh, one of the biggest libraries in the country as well. And one of my main aims is to revolutionize the Nepalese um, education system. We've taken Montessori there, and now it's growing great guns. So I've got my school on board. The kids are you know, raising money and bringing in resources. I've got other schools feeding into it too. I've got people all over the world sending boxes and books and you name it. Um, and I've kind of fallen into being a kind of a voice for Montessori now, you know. There's not many men in primary teaching in, in, you know, in the world True, anyway. Yeah. I think there's only two or three of us in Australia Montessori-trained primary school teachers. Oh, wow. um, and I've generated this big following of 100,000 people online, whatever, you know, and they're all teachers. And they're all in classrooms with 30 kids looking at them and they're, they're one of the front entertainer and the oracle and they want to get away from that. And so um, I've made that my goal, my aim. A lady asked me Monday, why are you doing all of this? Why are you doing it all? Like you work so hard all the time. And it's not for money. You never become a teacher for money. As so anyone out there looking to get rich being a teacher, just dream on. It's not happening. But you'll be Sorry rich. Sorry to disappoint you. Sorry, guys. But you will be rich in your heart. I mean, that's the fact. So, look, I, I just want to make a difference, make a change. It sounds hairy-fairy that I know that, yeah, it sounds like, you know, Bob Geldof or something. But it's not the case. There's a change. There's a revolution on the horizon. And people are talking about it all over the place. And, you know, I give up my evenings, my weekends, my holidays to do that, to be the voice for that. So I, I go to India, I do you know big talks to thousands of teachers and they all walk away uh, thinking, God, I've got to go to my class, I'm going to change it, I'm going to change it. I'm going to teach four kids at once and the other guys are going to be independent. I'm going to let them write their own curriculum. I'm going to observe them. And then, you know, you're, if you can train the teachers, well, then that's it. You're really changing the world. Changing the kids is great. Changing the teachers is big time. Yeah. Uh, so I, I've got into that. You know, I'm not letting my school down. I never take any time out of that. That's my main focus. I've got, you know, I've taken on a job there. My children, I take them under my wing. I want them to be successful. But, you know, maybe I've got ADHD. Maybe I've got uh, I've overactive something or other. But I've got too much energy. My wife always tells me, why don't you just sit down for a minute, have a cup of tea? But I always think... Does not strike yeah. me as your style. No, no, I just want to, you know, you, you can do it. I was, in, I was in Bankstown on Tuesday night with 100 teachers all working in uh, different Muslim schools. And they want to make a change too. So I, I'm out there, you know, going, this is how you do it, guys. And I, I'm all about giving it all away. So I've, you know, 25 years I've been a teacher. I've gathered so many resources, like a terabyte. So I made this Google Drive, you know, with a terabyte in it of resources. And I just flick it to people and say, here you go. Everything you could possibly ever need is in this drive. And they go, why are you giving, why are you giving this away? I said, why else am I going to do with it? You don't want to sell it, you know. Yeah. I'd feel like it was a crime trying to sell it. So I just yeah, give it away. And, uh, you know, some of the best experiences I've had in my life when people have given me stuff for free. So, yeah, I've made that my focus, my aim. And, Amazing. you know, being a, being a school principal is amazing on I always wanted to be one you don't get to teach as much but you get to you know do the big stuff like come here talk to you awesome well it sounds like some really wonderful initiatives in there um and you know any anybody who's listening anybody who uh is interested in this can find you on your website yeah and um get in touch with you through there we'll include that obviously in the links in the messaging going in around this um last thing I suppose I was going to ask for like a, a crazy story uh, from your years I feel like we've got a few already but if there's yeah. one more story or even piece of advice I mean is it can it be funny can it be slightly risque it can be slightly risque yes yep. okay. and, uh, we'll edit anything out that's too yeah you will yes. okay uh, well, um, well that's what we'll tell you anyway before yeah, we start I don't want to lose my job um <laughs> So, yeah, I was working over in Sheffield in England, uh, just become a teacher, wanted to be, you know, that innovative guy, 20 years old, just graduated, got some, got some uh, eggs, you know, in the classroom to hatch them with the kids, incubator, oh. thought, guys, we're going to hatch these eggs to his kids, the little kids were six, and uh, made one little boy, gave him responsibility, he said, look, you're in charge of the temperature, just keep your eye on it, can't be below 80 or above 100. No problem, you know, three or four days in, and three of the uh, chicks had hatched, Sunny, Sunshine, and Fluffy. Kids named them. Beautiful. Everything's going really well. And um, I was having lunch in the staff room, and suddenly the door bursts open. Little Benjamin, his name was, 
you know, you never just burst into the staff room. You never know what's going to be behind that door. Yeah, bold move. Bold move. Risky, but I knew something was up at that point. He's red in the face. He's like, Mr. McCormack, you've got to come. The incubator's on 150 degrees. <sighs> Yikes. So I, I threw my, you know, salad down, ran out the door, ran to the incubator, and sure enough, fluffy, sunshine, and uh, whatever, honey, whatever it's called, dead. Oh, dead no. as a door. So he's crying, and I said, look, don't worry about it. It's not your fault. Someone's knocked into the temperature gauge. You know, off you go on the playground. I'll sort this out. So off he goes out, and in my, you know, stupidity or lack of experience or whatever it was, there was a little flippling bid in the classroom, you know, that you use, and I just picked them up and threw them in there. Oh, no. Horrible. <laughs> and um, kids came in, and I said, look, guys, something terrible has happened. All the kids on the carpet are like, what is it, Mr. McCormack? And I said, look, I'm afraid we haven't been careful enough, and somebody has knocked into the temperature gauge and, it's been upon 150, and I'm afraid fluffy sunshine and honey have all been fried. I don't think I use fried. <laughs> Pretty graphic choice of You've words there, but boiled, <laughs> incinerated, no, I said, decimated. Oh, yeah, they've passed away. Yes. Said, you know, they've gone up moved to, on. They've gone up to chick heaven. Yeah, actually, I think I did use chick heaven. Okay, that's and good. Uh, they were like, "Well, what have you done?" I said, "I buried them. Buried them in the garden." Yeah, the Pinocchio nose growing out. Yeah, yeah, it's going right there. out there. You know, buried them in the garden. Yeah. So the kids, uh, you know, we have a, they're crying and hugging each other. I said, look, you know, let's just be careful. We'll, hopefully some of them or the eggs will hatch tomorrow. And uh, we got on with our afternoon. I remember we were painting. And I was on one table painting with some children and little boys over at the bin uh, sharpening his pencils. And uh, he's like, oh, Mr. McCormack. And I, went, I stopped. Yes. And he's like, I can hear a noise coming out the bin. And uh, I know. And I said, and I suddenly had this, I just remembered what I'd done. I was like, please, don't be the chicks. And then it, he, he puts his hand in and pulls it out with this chick alive with pencil sharpenings all on its head. Oh, my like God. Like a little hat. And I was like, oh, my God. And he, and he pulled them all out. from chick heaven. No, no, he pulled them all out. And out of all his hand, is like, uh, they're alive. It's fluffy and sunshine and honey. So all the kids started cheering and dancing around. They're alive. And I was like, it's a miracle. Anyway, one girl's just a little bit too smart, isn't she? And she turns around and shouts out, you're a liar. You're a liar. Like this. And all the kids turned on me then and all started turning on me from their smiles turning to frowns and their fingers are pointing at me, yes. you know, from the most popular guy in the class was like, they all thought I was the devil, saying, you're a liar. And they were going home. I remember them leaving the room saying, Mr. McCormack's a liar to their mums and dads as they walked down the path. I was like, I feel so ashamed. And I had to write an email out to parents saying, look, I made a huge mistake, but thank God I did. Because if I'd have buried them in the cot and I would have buried them alive. <laughs> so I made a mistake, but actually, you know, there was the universe telling me not to do it. And there you go. Anyway. Tenuous logic. Yeah, uh, but I learned from choice, very course. early, you do not lie to primary school children because they will find out. Yes. And when they find out, you lose their trust, you've lost. There you are. Two morals of the story for me. Number one, don't lie to primary school children. Number two, do not put chicks in the bin don't put them in the bin yep and don't put a six-year-old in charge of the temperature gauge yes well three miles then i yeah. suppose <laughs> yeah exactly right wonderful well yeah. listen gavin it's been an absolute pleasure Me having too. you in yep. um, and best of luck with everything to come with the montessori and the initiatives over in nepal it all sounds amazing um until next time guys enjoy yourself uh, we will see you back for whatever weird or wonderful corner of the education world we find ourselves in. Then, in the meantime, you can check us out at getatomy.com. It's goodbye from Gavin. Goodbye. And goodbye from me. See ya.